Okay, and with that, welcome to Canvas and Currents episode three. I am here with my friend Julius, and this is Julius. Hey, guys. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> uh, Julius is an award-winning uh, scientific illustrator. He's a paleo artist. He... He illustrates species that haven't been uh, walking around on this planet for a very long time. Am I saying this right, Julius? Yeah, or swimming around even. Yeah, <laughs> Or swimming around. They haven't <laughs> been on the surface of this planet or under the sea of this planet for a very long time. Um, and with me here with Canvas and Currents, uh, Julius is once a month painting a painting, drawing... Chiseling. I don't know yeah, what, what we'll be doing. Some over the sort of fashioning, exactly. <laughs> we're, we're creating stuff. <laughs> we're, doing, we're doing art. It's art. And um, I'm so happy to have Julius because I have no artistic talent whatsoever. <laughs> I keep telling people I, I'm stuck uh, when it comes to um, marine mammals. I can, I can draw uh, some mean stick porpoises. <laughs> that is, that's about the best thing I can Actually, do. Actually, you drew a very mean stick porpoise on the wall um, that's uh, <laughs> right behind you there in neon light, which is very that's, impressive. That's right, right? Yeah. Can They've I point the camera up a little bit? Look at that. Look at yeah. that. Got beautiful blues and greens. Very, very nice to look at. It's even nicer in person here. It's just this beautiful, tranquil color. Now I messed up my camera. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what will we be doing today? Julius, we've, got, we've, we've picked a species today. We have a beat. We are be. We are be. <laughs> we haven't picked a linguistic center yet. <laughs> uh, we're going to be covering the um, uh, local species here in BC, the uh, harbor porpoise. Yeah, one of uh, one of the smallest whales. I mean, porpoises are quite small, uh, generally under two meters. So, and we we picked one of them, <laughs> the one that we can find uh, generally in our ocean backyard. There's a lot of them. Uh, we checked and. Uh, the science says it's around 700,000 individuals. We usually give give ranges because we don't know for sure. So uh, I think uh, 700,000 to a million individuals. So that's a lot of animals. Um, and we're going to talk about them, uh, about their wide distribution, where you can find them around the world and what's happening with Harbor Purpose. But uh, Julius is going to be using what what's your medium of the day so the first episode uh, on orcas we uh, uh, did colored pencils on black paper that was fun the second episode uh, we covered um, um, dow's porpoise and for that I uh, used um, uh, soft pastels dry pastels on uh, pastel paper and this time we're gonna be doing pen and ink so uh, I'm gonna be doing mostly like an outline and showing a little some of the, the hatching techniques but also I've got some markers, some colored markers to add a little bit of additional um, color to it. So we're going to be doing a couple of things that way. Okay, I'm excited. I'm always excited. Um, I've got a, a real life, actual, fully functioning artist. Fully functioning. <laughs> yeah, that's questionable. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all doing our best. Um, yes. <laughs> um, and we have lots of cameras, so I can actually show you what Julius is doing. Okay. And yeah. this is one of our views. That's a harbor purpose in the making. Yep, in the making, yeah. So this is basically how I set these up. I, I just use a very light, light lines um, with a pencil. Uh, and right now it's easy because it's gonna be in, on white paper. The previous ones were black and then blue paper um, for the different ones. So that was, I had to use different kinds of pencils for that. In this case, it's just gonna be white paper and it's nice bright, smooth white paper, which is a nice uh, marker paper. Uh, so it doesn't doesn't uh, have much bleed of ink when you apply it, which is important because you want the lines to be nice and sharp. And so right now I set this up in, in pencil, do a little bit of racing, get the proportions right as much as possible, and we're going to have a harbor porpoise kind of in a, a slightly more dynamic view than your typical sort of side view of an animal. Uh, I always like to make things a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more like coming toward us or away from us, a little bit more interesting that way. Okay, and I'm going to try and get the other camera set up. It's, we've got everything under control here, as always. Um, I think if I'm showing this camera, it's it's upside down. So our mm -hmm. audience watching online, you can actually see this in real time as we're doing this. Oh, yeah, actually, you just did hang it. from I the just... ceiling like a bath. It's okay. <laughs> we got a big chandelier, you're fine. I'm just going to try and turn this around on the camera itself. And, uh, Julius, maybe you can just talk a little bit about the sure. things you're drawing there. Sure, sure. Yeah, so um, harbor porpoises, porpoises in general, right? Uh, so 
when we're talking about porpoises, we know that these are toothed uh, cetaceans. Cetaceans are all the marine mammals that include whales, dolphins, and porpoises. And uh, there are two very major groups of them. One group are the toothed um, cetaceans or whales, and the other group is the, the baleen whales. So you have um, different groups that branch off at different times in the past. And uh, <laughs> having things about me here. <laughs> and then uh, porpoises are, are one of them that are uh, the tooth, among the toothed groups. And other toothed whales include like sperm whales, for example. There's a whole group of them. There are lots of sp different kinds in the past and millions of years, years ago. Absolutely fascinating diversity. Um, and then there are also uh, river dolphins. Uh, there are a lot of the more typical sort of marine dolphins. Uh, and then there are porpoises. And uh, we covered uh, uh, one of the porpoises last week, the Dallas porpoise, and we covered another one, the, a dolphin, uh, the orca, in the first episode. Um, and then, so all of these toothed whales, so to speak, uh, encompass one major group. And of course, there was a major change that happened millions of years ago when a group of whales explored another way of feeding using baleen, those plates in their mouth that uh, allow them to filter out water and retain krill and other types of plankton in their mouth, and they're basically they're filter feeders. But the vast majority um, of the other species are um, their hunting predators, basically. And the harbor porpoise is one of them. Uh, the harbor porpoise is actually one of the smaller ones, as uh, Marcus mentioned. There are eight, I guess, eight recognized species of porpoises today, is it? Or seven? seven? Some say that the... Uh, depends how you separate. The finless porpoise. Yeah, there's a couple of finless ones, and it depends on how you separate those out. So seven or eight species of porpoise today. Uh, if any of you are familiar with, probably a lot of you are familiar with uh, the fact that we've also, from this very studio, broadcast the, um, the special yearly event uh, called the International Save the Vaquita Day. And of course, the vaquita is the world's smallest porpoise. It's also the most endangered marine mammal in the world, and one of the most endangered mammals in, in period, with you know, anywhere between 8 to 12 individuals. And they're dying because they're getting caught in illegally set uh, nets by poachers for another species of fish, so it's tragic. Um, harbor porpoises, as Marcus mentioned, have numbered like 700,000 to a million, so globally, they're doing well. They have a stable population, uh, more or less. But um, there are populations of them that are also at great risk. So there's, for example, the Black Sea population is completely separate from the rest of them. Uh, it's uh, basically landlocked, and there are uh, less than 12,000 of those individuals left. And of course, now with the war in that area uh, and all kinds of other um, threats, they're under a lot more stress and, um, and, and experiencing a lot of threats that, that they wouldn't otherwise be. So uh, keep in mind that you know, when we're talking about a species of animal, it's much more complicated than just putting them into one pool and saying they're all equal to each other. In fact, they're not. And, among harbor porpoises themselves, you know, we have a type that is common here on the coast of BC where we are, but in the North Atlantic, for example, there have been recognized about at least three different genetic, um, genetically distinct populations. So, you know, we're looking at uh, a species that's composed of many, many subpopulations that are different from each other. And, you know, whales and dolphins differ not just in their appearance, uh, but also in their behavior. So you have some groups like for those of us that are familiar with the southern resident um, orcas here, uh, they have differences in culture from different uh, uh, individuals of, of, of another group uh, of the same species. So the big uh, orcas will eat fish, for example, but the, um, the southern residents will eat uh, almost exclusively um, Chinook salmon. And so they have different ways of hunting, different uh, social dynamics, different dialects of their communication with each other. So, you know, some may understand each other between some of these small smaller populations, but then populations that are more distant might not understand them as well. And so communication is distinctly different. It's a fascinating thing. They teach their young how to hunt differently. Anyway, so that's orcas, but you can also see how, uh, because harbor porpoises are also predatory, they need to have skills to hunt fish, and they mostly hunt small fish, like herring and various other kinds. Uh, and so they sometimes hunt uh, solitarily and sometimes in groups, so you have some interaction happening. So. Culture is a potentially important part of a lot of these organisms' lives. And we understand so wrong camera. We understand so little <laughs> about them, right? When especially when it comes to to culture for most of those cetaceans, right? We we talk yeah. about those killer whales, be, orcas, because 
there's a lot of studies going on. It's pretty easy to find them because they're very big. They spend a lot of time on the surface. But when we talk about species like harbor porpoise, mm-hmm. we can't answer the simplest mm-hmm. questions because they spend 95% of their time underwater. And we can't interview them. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's even things like tagging individuals, following individuals for species like harbor porpoise or any of the, I don't know, 97, 98, I don't know how many species of cetaceans we currently have. But for the vast majority of them, we know... Next to nothing. Yeah, that's it. And, and if, yeah, the, you're right. I mean, th- that's the thing. I mean, you, you, Marcus, you've got a lot more experience with, with sighting harbor porpoises than, than I have. I've seen them a couple of times, but that's it. You guys have seen them tons. But, I mean, I know that they hunt mostly on the bottom in shallow water. And so, yeah, you're not going to see them often. And then when they do come to the surface, they're not very dramatic like orcas. They don't do those big breaches, for example, and humpback whales, you know, that everybody loves to see, a big splash and all that. Yeah, for harbor purpose, it's more like you you act, you have to convince people that there is something there to begin with because it's just this tiny little dorsifin. And like behind me, that porpoise actually has a huge dorsifin <laughs> compared to uh, what that actually would be when it comes to proportions. You can't see that now, of course. Um, it's more like a spectacled porpoise male or something. It's got a sort of roundish dorsifin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's true. All right, and now that we've learned a little bit about uh, purposes and cetaceans, let's uh, let's let me show you what I've well, just done there above you. So that's yeah, there you go. So nice, it's it's right side up now, so no problems. This is good. <laughs> um, and uh, so I've set up the overall sort of guide for the, um, the 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 ink image using pencil, and so we're we've got this porpoise that's kind of if you can see it, it's kind of. It's bending its body. This is the front end here with the head and then the little melon, little rounded part on top of their forehead. Uh, and it's coming at us at a sort of an oblique angle, so not quite lateral, not quite straight out, but in between. There's that little dorsal fin, a little triangular dorsal fin. And then they're quite flexible in their body, and we're kind of showing that by having it twist the back part of its body, the, the trunk of the tail, away as it kind of maneuvers through the water. They're pretty maneuverable little animals. Uh, and in fact, even here with the tail, with the flukes, um, I've actually made them look a little asymmetrical because I'm mis- imagining that these flukes are bending a little bit. So this, the one on, on, on this side here is bending a little bit so that you see a little bit more face on. And this other one is already kind of bending a little bit that way. So you're seeing a little bit of a difference in the thickness of towards the end. So again, interesting sort of aspects about displaying um, animals in different postures than just, you know, a boring side view, in my opinion. I like to kind of be a little bit more interesting that way. Uh, it allows you to show behaviors of different kinds. It makes it just much more interesting to draw, and you can see more of the animal as well. I'd like to show you, um, before we get into the drawing, kind of a, a little graphic that I created, a uh, painting. I'm gonna, just going to go here to our just screen yard share and your share this. screen, yeah. Mm-hmm. And this will put us into the it'll put it in the harbor porpoise into the context of um, among all the different porpoise species. And when Julius gets that uh, screen share ready, I just want to welcome all our viewers from all over the planet. I know you're watching from uh, from many different countries on many different continents. Uh, wherever you're watching from, on whichever platform you're watching from, if you have any questions for us, if you have any comments, anything you always wanted to say to Julius, um, meet a real artist and ask him all the questions you can come up with. Uh, you can do that via the uh, chat box on whatever platform you're on. If you're on YouTube or on Twitch, you can use the built-in chat function there. Um, you can use the comments function on Facebook. And uh, there's some place on all those platforms where you can leave comments and we'll read them all. We're paying close attention to them. <laughs> and Julius, you've got this ready. Yeah, got it all logged in and loaded up and so here we go so this is uh kind of a little synopsis of all the living species of porpoise that we know about and here i've listed seven of them so yeah it kind of depends on how we did you know divide some of these finless porpoises but it's seven or eight and um so you can see there are and these are all to scale right so there are some larger ones and some smaller ones the biggest one is the one we covered last week the dal's porpoise that's the one on the lower right here and it's, uh, it's a really neat animal because of the sharp black and white contrast. It has a little bit of a look like an orca, in fact. It's a very strange-shaped animal. We talked all about its hydrodynamics and so on. It was really interesting, I think. Uh, the smallest porpoise is the vaquita. And I mentioned already the vaquita is that one that's the most endangered as well. And it's just to the upper left of the Dallas porpoise. 
And uh, notice also the dorsal fins of all these porpoises. Look how much variation there is. Huge range and diversity of the types, the shapes of their dorsal fins, or even their presence and absence. You already can see that there are two uh, finless porpoises, so-called, because they are actually completely missing their dorsal fin. The rest of them have an interesting diversity. The Dallas porpoise has this forward canted dorsal fin with a kind of a hook on it. The vaquita has a, a very shark-like or, or dolphin-like dorsal fin. That's the one that's the most uh, upright of the, of the, among the porpoises. Then you have this really wonky, weird one, the spectacled porpoise. Now, it's only the male that has this particular shape of dorsal fin, but look at that thing. It's just like a giant half pancake or something sitting on its back. <laughs> on an end. It's I just was referring to half a satellite dish or half something. Half a satellite dish, exactly. It's the strangest looking thing. Really interesting. You can't miss it. Burmeister's porpoise up here on the top left has a very backward pointed triangular dorsal fin. So really kind of like, uh, so yeah, it's just really sharply pointed backward, more, 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 more laterally um, than, than vertically. And finally, we come to the harbor porpoise, the one we're focusing on today and the one on the upper right here. So this guy's got a little triangular dorsal fin, nondescript, kind of like a, a very humble dolphin's uh, dorsal fin. It's not, you know, I'm not doing too much, just sitting there on top. Uh, it actually reminds me of the second dorsal fin of some sharks, if some people are familiar with those. Um, some of them are sort of that shape. So anyway, Wait, second uh, dorsal fin. Yeah, so sharks uh, typically most sharks have two dorsal fins, one bigger one in the front and one smaller one in the back. And um, oh yes, of there course. are a few exceptions like the the cow sharks and so on, and the feral sharks that have one dorsal fin, but most have two. And the the second dorsal fin of some of the Carcharhinus uh, sharks or the the Carcharhinidae sharks look a little bit like the uh, the the only dorsal fin of the. Um, Harbor porpoise, so you know, low triangle, um, humble triangle. So that's our harbor porpoise. It's sort of in between. It's a smaller one of them, but it's not the smallest. Um, so there we go. So that those are all the porpoises that that we're looking at here. Um, uh, you know, when we're when we're talking about porpoises, but um, we're going to be talking about this one in particular. And you also see that the harbor porpoise has an interesting bit of variation in its color, in that. It has a lot of speckling on the sides, and so that's something that you don't see in most other dorsal, most other porpoises. There's either these sharp delineations of lines or just a single color or whatever. And I'm um, so I'm so grateful they have that because <laughs> in in the field we use uh, we use the side of the animal. If if, we, if they come out of the uh, above the surface high enough that you can actually see that mottled gray sort of thing, it's sort of like harbor seals, kind of like a fingerprint because it's unique for each individual. Mm -hmm. So. That, that helps identify the animals uh, when we're trying to do photo identification. And if, if you're into like punishment, then that is one of the things <laughs> I highly recommend trying. Well, and, and that's also really useful because the reason why would you want to be able to recognize individuals? Because you need to be able to tell who's who and so that when you're counting them, you can get an accurate count. Otherwise, how do you know that you're not counting the same individual twice? But if you can distinguish them individually, then you can have a better idea of their true numbers. And that's crucially important for species that are threatened uh, in various ways and are experiencing declines in populations. So That's right. And you mentioned the vaquita earlier. That they're, they're doing that there as well. And it's even more important. The fewer animals you have, the more important it is to, to be able to distinguish them and to say, like, do I have five or six individuals? Because we're yep. down to those low numbers, right, where it's really important to get that done. Yep, absolutely. But absolutely. Um, Okay, so shall we start with uh, drawing this porpoise? Putting Absolutely. Some, some ink to the paper, maybe? <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to see if this is actually working okay here. I've got a couple of different pens. Uh, so I love using these really fine tipped pens, and a lot of you guys will recognize these, and probably a lot of people enjoy them. I've got, I've got the 005, which is really skinny, skinny tip. Uh, I've got the 01 and the 02 as well, which will give us different uh, thicknesses of line capability. Um, and so we're going to use this both to outline the animal and also to start with some of the hatching. I'll also probably show you some techniques, um, whether we go with hatching or stippling. That's another interesting possibility. We go stippling or pointillism. I really love doing that. It's a little bit more time consuming though. So um, I'm thinking that today we might actually go with um, hatching for some of that and then use also some of the other um, pens that I've got here, which are these felt pens, um, and uh, these are nice because you can apply a little bit of color 
but um, not too much. Uh, so you kind of give it a little bit of a, make it a little bit more interesting. So I'm actually going to start with my zero one here. So we've got the overall shape of the animal. I'm going to start uh, overlaying the pencil. And of course, because it's in pencil, afterwards I can always erase that out. So all we have left is the ink. Because this ink, of course, is once it's there, it's permanent. All right. Yeah. The, the back to a medium where you can actually erase your mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> this is nice, actually, isn't it? Uh, but once we get the, the, the ink down, that's going to change completely. And we are no longer able to erase that. So it's, I always find working with ink interesting because it has this permanence to it. Most of the time as a scientific illustrator, I work with digital media. Usually I work with things like Photoshop and um, I use a stylus, um, a digital stylus on an interactive LCD display. And uh, I can, this is nice because working with other scientists for producing press release images or museum murals or whatever, I'm able to modify things more easily, which is important if we're getting new information, for example, or, you know, you know, because they have more expertise than me in particular areas, even though I have also a biological background, it's easier for me to change things um, to refine them as I'm getting information from the team members. Uh, and I can work in layers that way too. I can work on, a, on the top layer or something underneath uh, independently. So I don't have that, uh, that uh, privilege here. Uh, we're using the old traditional style of, of artwork, which I love to do. Uh, it has its own challenges. And one of the challenges, of course, here is the permanence of the ink. And once that's down there, uh, you have to either work around it or try to modify it as best you can. Um, and so we're going to try to make as few errors as possible, which is, of course, why I set this up first in pencil as an outline. So right now I'm starting at the very tip of the animal's head. You can follow along with, if you like. This is kind of like an eight and a half by 11 inch page. Let me just see what is it I've got here. This is, um, oh, sorry, nine by 12. I was wrong about that. Nine by 12. It's pretty close. But um, so the, this animal is roughly torpedo shaped, uh, you know, barring the bending of the body that we've got happening here. Tor torpedoes aren't very good at bending their bodies so much until once they've already done their thing, I think. Uh, so this is a very different kind of a torpedo. They're, however, because of that, wonderfully hydrodynamically effective and moving through the water. They're just really efficient. That's probably not in uh, weapons development. We are in a different yes, world. Exactly. Like we're not this designing not torpedoes that just yeah. wouldn't go well. well oddly, though, um, remember, we're, we're familiar also with cetaceans being used by certain countries in their military to train them to um, deliver explosives underwater to ships, which is just horrific because when you think about it, basically the animal will die too. It's just, it's just the, the most unethical use of, of, of these animals. It's horrible. Um, so yeah, we, we don't want that. We don't like that. Not at all. Uh, so I've got the sort of the chin of the animal here. This is the, the very tip here is where the mouth ends. The mouth is very much situated at the tip of, of, of the snout. And I'm just moving along to trace out this chin area and then underneath the throat. And then I'm moving with a little dotted line where the, the right pectoral fin or the flipper is going to be and just continue off underneath until I hit the left pectoral fin or flipper. Pectoral fins and flippers um, are interchangeable in, in, in cetaceans. In cetaceans or dolphins and whales, uh, flippers are the specific term we use for pectoral fins that are homologous to those of fish. And when I say homologous, I mean they have a common evolutionary um, origin. And they're also homologous to these, our arms and hands. Uh, so I'm using my pectoral appendages to draw the, <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> the marine mammals pectoral appendages now. <laughs> And uh, so you get, um, you know, evolution is wonderful in, 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 in ending up with these interesting variations on a theme. So I'm going to just draw this right flipper. And their flippers are sh kind of hooked backward a little bit. And just a little bit. And then at the base, they have this sort of corner and then they kind of narrow a bit. So that flipper, we're seeing the inside of it. So it's like if I'm looking at the inside of my palm, okay? that's what it's looking like. And in fact, they have bones, like finger bones all throughout here. It's pretty amazing when you, if you've ever seen the, the skeleton of a cetacean, how, how much like a hand they, they typically look. Uh, but it's just all covered over by soft tissue. So you can't see the individual fingers separated because that's how it's most efficient for traveling underwater, right? It's a paddle. It's a steering mechanism, actually in cetaceans. They use their flukes, the, the sort of the specialized tail fin that has evolved de novo and um, very specialized in cetaceans and has no homologue in any other um, 
animal. Uh, and so they used that, that the base of the tail and, and that, uh, those flukes for thrust, for propulsion, for pushing them forward through the water. And the flippers they use for steering. And so that's what we have here. We have these wonderful little So we should have our microphone back. Mm -hmm. um, should be okay now? We should be. Okay. We should be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna... Just some feedback. Okay. Our, our production manager says the, the audio has come back. Sorry, Christine, we needed a few minutes to figure this out. This was very mysterious. Um, so I guess the question is how much did we miss? Um, I think we missed two minutes of audio. Two minutes. Oh, yeah, okay. maybe we can just jump back in by, yeah. I have marked one comment. Somebody mm -hmm. asked a question. Mm -hmm. uh, Lily oh. White asks us, what are the dorsal fins for? A really good question, Lily. Um, dorsal fins are similar feature as if you look at a plane, the tail fin, for example. The reason that, they, that a lot of them need a tail fin is for stabilization. They're called a vertical stabilizer as well. And um, basically, when you're moving through any medium like air or water, um, there's a tendency for objects to kind of rotate in ways you don't want them to. So what you do is you, you set up this, this vertical fin coming off it at some point that provides very little resistance in a forward-backward way. It's very thin in cross-section, but it's also very, very th large surface area uh, for preventing air moving side to side uh, from, from um, uh, 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 it resists air that way. So in other words, you have resistance from both directions. So in other words, it also, it causes the object to be able to move more smoothly in a straight line. It's a stabilizer that keeps the object from rolling around too easily. And so just gives more stability to uh, cetaceans and harbor porpoises have a small one, uh, but it's still effective to keep them um, requiring less energy to keep themselves stabilized uh, while they're swimming. So the less energy you need to use for swimming, the more of it you can use for other things like uh, you know, swimming <laughs> to places where you can get food or to finding mates or to raising babies. All this stuff is going to be very important in the long run. Uh, every bit of energy that you waste is, 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 
is important in the end. It adds up, and the less energy you waste, the more you can do um, that you, you need to do to survive and have lots more of a bigger population. Okay, I want to quickly uh, do a microphone check because uh, you do sound a little bit distorted okay. somehow. It's oh, okay. almost like you made changes to the microphone. Can you... I didn't, as far as I know, but... Uh, okay, well, let's check. Uh, how's that sounding? Is there any, any changes? Um, I, I can distort my voice, too, if you like, but it's probably not going to help. <laughs> maybe myself. that's what it was. Maybe that's, maybe that's what it was. I'm getting too uh, animated here or something. Yeah. No, it sounds, it sounds okay it's now. It's okay now? All right. Maybe what happened is that I might have put my arm in front of it that it might have caused oh, it maybe. to. So I'll just watch that. Okay. okay, there we go. We're okay, back. Okay. We're, I'm functional we're, again. It was some mostly functional artist here. Mo mostly. Uh, <laughs> there's no guarantee, but that's You know, okay. with our, our standards, <laughs> I, I should tell people I've, I've just returned from, from Africa. I'm, I'm still very jet-lagged. And, and Julius, I'm not sure uh, how we describe that, but you've had a very turbulent uh, few it's, weeks, at least a month. It's been a year. It's, uh, it's been it's a year. It's been an interesting year. So, so um, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm doing well, but you know, I'm still a little exhausted from a lot of stuff. So I think that what we're seeing here is kind of like I'm probably in the um, in some sort of a I, I can res, you know jump into a few little strengths and just kind of have this crazy sort of appearance. <laughs> I'm always good at that. I, I love I love public speaking anyway, so it works well for me. Um, yeah, we're at least functioning on the on the same amount of sleep right now. So um, or you probably get less sleep. Oh than my I goodness, these my days. schedule is, is it just stupid sometimes with the artwork sometimes. So whatever. Um. <laughs> okay, let's get back to the artwork. All right, uh, that's that's one of the things that that tends to work for you. Um, mm -hmm. No matter how much sleep you get, which which is very impressive to me. No, I can um, tell you stories of things happening while I was falling asleep, <laughs> though. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's let's go back to this uh, okay. top-down view. So here we go. So uh, I'm going to move toward the head of the animal. So I was just talking about the shape of the overall head, the overall shape of the head of the harbor porpoise, which is a little bit more sharp pointed than most other porpoises. And so there's a little bit of a notch here where the mouth is. And then there's a wee, wee bit of a beak. Now, a beak, right? Dolphins, like bottlenose dolphins, have this long beak, right? Like bottlenose, kind of in the name. Uh, porpoises generally don't have a beak that's anywhere near that. But there's a tiny, tiny bit of a hint of a beak here. So there's a little bit of a, an inflection point there. And then it goes up, and there's a little bit of a curvature at the top of the, of the forehead. So this is the melon. It's, I mean, it's kind of aptly named because it is shaped a little bit like a melon. It's that soft tissue inside of which you have a lot of the, the sound producing equipment. And um, so it's very important for projection and reception of, um, of the clicks that a lot of uh, cetaceans do for um, echolocation uh, underwater, for example. And uh, actually, these guys, um, harbor porpoises, do also produce clicks and uh, they range anywhere from about, um, somewhere about, I think it was 20 uh, hertz to about two kilohertz, which is right in the middle of our range of hearing. So we can definitely hear them as humans. There are some that, that are much more high frequency, but these ones we can hear as little clicks that they make. Right up here. Sorry, did I, did yeah. I, did I miss, we we're talking about harbor porpoise? Yeah. Their, 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 their clicks and their, uh, it's, it's all clicks for them. Um, they are in the very high ultrasonic range, oh, uh, up to maybe 150 kilohertz or so. Oh, interesting. Okay, so then, all right, okay. So, well, listen to Marcus on this, because he knows more <laughs> about that. I, 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 I read something different, I guess. Yeah, right. So that's interesting. Okay, that's cool. So, yeah, um, but that's still within our range of hearing. Um, 150 kilohertz. Our hearing be. range ends at about 20 kilohertz. 20, yeah. So, oh, 150. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's right. super high. So okay, like so 130 or even 150 kilohertz. <laughs> forget what I said entirely. Yeah, complete <laughs> misinformation from the artist trying to be the scientist again. <laughs> Okay, then. <laughs> well, you're much more scientist than I am, but uh, apparently I've been, I've well, been telling the story a lot more times. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've spent a lot less time doing anything at all, at all with harbor porpoises. So this is Marcus's uh, sort of bag of experience that, is, that we should be listening to here. <laughs> I can draw them, but we'll, we'll keep it at that mostly. <laughs> so anyway, right up here at the top of the head, uh, behind the melon is where the, the blowhole would be. Right? And so there's this little, little, well, you can't really see it because it's on the top of the head, but... It's that, that opening through which all cetaceans would breathe, right? They don't breathe through their mouth. They breathe through modified nostrils, which are the blowhole. They're on top here, of course, because when they surface, they don't have to, like, 
they can keep swimming forward and the top of the body surfaces and then they can breathe that way. So it's pretty effective. Then we go back from here along the body, this. And so it's got, again, this sort of torpedo-shaped body. That's the front half. And then as the animal is turning its body, twisting it, the rest of that body is going to have more of a curvature than you would see from the side. Remember the picture that I showed you of the harbor porpoise before from the side view that I'd painted that had you know, very much a typical sort of a nice torpedo or tuna shape. Um, but here we're going to see it differently because it's already bending its body. Before we get there, I'm going to draw the dorsal fin that we were talking about just before. And this dorsal fin is going to look to you a little bit more vertical than I had shown you in the side view. And that's because the animal is sort of turning away from us at that point. His body is twisting. So we're seeing this a little bit more foreshortened. It's kind of like instead of seeing my hand flat on like this, it's bent a little bit. And so now you can see that it looks a bit narrower in this way. That's kind of what's happening here. All right, so then there's a dorsal fin. And then the body, as I mentioned, twists toward the left and downward and toward the flukes or the tail. And then the belly uh, continues from underneath the left flipper. It's a little bit of a bulgy belly. And then it also goes into this twist here. And toward the end there, it's, it's quite narrow at the very end where the, where the, the, the tail stalk meets the flukes. Um, and the, the, the flukes, of course, are the specially designed or specially evolved feature, sorry, um, in cetaceans only. Well, also some Serenians or um, you know, relatives like manatees and sea cows and dugongs have a similar shaped tail, uh, especially, man uh, especially dugongs, which have a very whale-like tail. Uh, again, that has evolved uh, separately, but independently of that of whales. Dugong tails and whale tails arose evolutionarily completely independently two separate times. Okay? So there's no actual connection between the two uh, in terms of ancestry. That's kind of neat, I think. Um, and so... Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you there because we were talking about, uh, you were talking about melons. I've got an interesting question there. Uh, uh, do, do they have a squishy head Ooh. like belugas? Because oh, belugas have a very soft head. I've never touched the head of a, of a, of a harbor porpoise. That, Marcus, have you ever? I, are they squishy? I've touched, I've touched the harbor porpoise, but uh, not the melon area. Okay, okay. I don't think they like that. Yeah, <laughs> it was more of the back of the animal, but um, yeah, right. it's it's fatty tissues, very yeah. similar. It's made of the th yeah. same things, yeah. fulfills the same function. So I would assume well, it's kind of squishy. If, if you look at the skull of these animals, it's interesting. There, the, there's the the jaws, which are you know really quite robust with the teeth, um, but then toward the back. There's, there's nothing supporting that melon. Toward the back, there's kind of like a forward um, pointed, kind of like a concave, like a satellite dish sort of shape almost. And, and the whole front area where the melon is, is all soft tissue. There's no bone there at all, uh, you know, until you get down to the jaws. And, and then, of course, there's lots of blubber around the base as well. So they look a lot fatter than their, their skull would suggest. So the melon must be quite soft overall. So I, I have to say we have a, we have additional people. Our team is actually much larger than you would think. We have one additional person who is our production manager, and Christine. She says they are not squishy. They are Ooh. actually much, uh, they are harder. Interesting. She says. Interesting. So okay. she doesn't. My, I'm not sure where she gets that information from. She also touched the harbor purpose. She actually touched oh, an additional nice. harbor purpose that I didn't touch. You lucky so people. I she <laughs> she I mean, may know that. Don't go out touching whales, okay? We're not advocating don't, that. Don't, uh, don't, don't do this stuff. at home. Yeah. Don't. We're actually illegal. It, we're not allowed to get into the water with cetaceans here in BC. And it's important because we need to respect their space. Um, when we go there, we disturb them. And sometimes they're doing very important things like feeding or raising their young or resting. And we don't want to get in the way because you know, they're, they, we need to respect them just like all life forms. And um, so, yeah, we can't get in the water with them. We can't approach them closer than a certain amount. Um, if we have our boats off, if we're on the water and they come toward us, then we can enjoy the experience of having to see them close up and then we can relish that, but that's their choice. It's all about the respect and giving them the driver's seat. And don't go up and try to touch them or harass them because that's just not nice. It's not decent. I saw some some recent research that, that came out a few days ago, I think, uh, that had some graphics attached to it. I think a video sequence where you could, uh, where you could see displacement 
uh, of of whales. They don't, I don't think they specified which species of whales, but it showed how vessel activity was changing how the animals were foraging. So it basically in real time tracked animals and vessels, and you could see that. Uh, that they were changing their their behavior. They were basically trying to get away from the from the boats. Yes. So while they were trying to eat, they mm -hmm. were trying to get away from all those boats, which in our waters, which are quite busy, yeah. uh, can be quite a bit of a challenge. So I imagine if you are in a bunch of whale watching boats, uh, yeah. even if your intention is to just you know sit there and wait for an animal to approach you, that that can probably be quite problematic if, yeah. if, you're, if you're getting too close and if, it, if there's too many of them. So any kind of boat, no matter what boat it is, um, do what Julia said, like, leave them in peace. <laughs> Give them their space. They've, yeah, they've, they've got enough going on in their That's habitats. Right. And, um, and it's true, as, as Marcus was saying, they're very sensitive to the noise caused by boats. And um, you can see that um, in addition to that, there are these uh, devices called seal scarers that are used by some fishermen to try to keep seals away from their, their fishing catch. And uh, these porpoises have been known to give a wide berth to those kinds of um, shocking sounds up to like 10 kilometers or so. So that can really affect how they're interacting with each other. If they need to be hanging out in an area to feed or to uh, socialize, now they can't because they've been scared off by these really loud sonic devices. And there was even uh, an incident in, I think it was 1982, that there was an explosion at sea um, uh, in an oil rig, if I'm not mistaken, and it killed something like, was it 300 harbor porpoises or something like that? Like, it's insane how much damage can be done by shock waves underwater to wildlife. It's The water is a much thicker medium than air. So you know how it feels when we get an explosion in the air or, or something that, that causes a loud sound, how terrible that is for our ears. But in the water, the water is thicker and carries a lot more energy in, in its waves. And so an explosion underwater can not just sound loud, it can actually do physical damage to organisms. It can kill fish and kill uh, cetaceans. And so this is why it's so important for us to regulate sounds underwater, such as boat traffic, because that sound has a lot more uh, potential to cause harm and disturbance to wildlife underwater than it would above water. So anyway, so here we go. So we're back to the, the flukes of this animal now, and we'll just draw the flukes. And remember I mentioned that we're doing this in such a way we're pretending it's a little bit twisted. So the flukes have these nice little hook dens. And it comes back, and then there's just a little bit of a notch in the center. And then this other fluke on the, on the right side is actually going to end up a little narrower at the end because it's twisting a little bit. It's a complex kind of shape. It's a soft tissue. Thing. There's no bones in the flukes. Okay? This is all soft tissue. The only bones are in the spine that ends uh, at the base of the flukes. These flukes, as I mentioned, independently evolved. And um, aside from the Serenians, no other uh, marine mammal has these kinds of things. And uh, there is no equivalent in, in, in land-dwelling animals. There's no need to. I mean, you know, things like beavers can have wider tails, but the, the tail goes through that, 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 um, that widened tail, for example. And in, in, in whales, it doesn't go all the way. It's a whole other structure that's all soft tissue and muscle and such. Uh, so really kind of a neat uh, evolutionary adaptation to their way of life in the water compared to what their ancestors were like on land. Because, yeah, they evolved from land dwelling animals that looked a little bit like a cross between, a, oh goodness, like a tapir and a, a pig or some small hoofed mammals. Some like sort of hoofed. Yeah, yeah, and so you get some really small, um, yeah, almost, almost, like, almost a little bit like a peccary, but a little bit different. We have to do an episode where we do some yeah. paleo oh, art, where yeah, we get into, oh, yeah. where yeah, we where sense. we get into the species that are yeah. no longer there, but that played a very important role in the evolution yeah. of these Absolutely. animals. Absolutely. So let's finish up doing the outline of the animal, so that we can. Um, we're getting close to the point where we're going to take a break, and then we're going to do the rest of the um, the shading and such. So I'm going to put the mouth in. So they're really cute mouths. Uh, they have a little bit of a slight upper notch here, and then it kind of goes a little bit down. And then it kind of turns a little bit and goes back upward like this. Kind of a, like a little, little smile. <laughs> and, if, and they're complex in shape. They have this, the way that it comes outward as well. So if you look at it from the front, it's a little bit different. You've got this cute little smile happening. It's kind of more pointed toward the tip. The other neat thing about um, porpoises and dolphins, a lot of the time, and other whales, their eyes are actually located very close to the level of their mouth, not much above it. And so when we draw the eye, it's going to be this little... A little lemon shape, just 
barely above the end of the mouth, very, very close to in line, okay? like that. And also keep in mind that the eye actually is uh, situated in a, in a bony um, uh, socket that sort of bulges out a little bit. And so when you see these and when they're shaded, there's, there's a little bit of a, a bulge around the eye and, and they're slightly downward pointed, but just ever so slightly. Okay? So we're not gonna show that here right now with, the, with this pen right now, but um, keep that in mind for as we shade it. Um, okay, so that's kind of the outline of our animal. It's a really simple outline. They only have four um, uh, components that are like rudders or, or, you know, other kind of propulsive devices, right? The two flippers, the dorsal fins, one dorsal fin, and then the flukes. And so very different from a lot of other animals that live in the water, like certain fish, which have a lot more uh, fins of various kinds. And uh, so the next stage is to start to add some depth to it. And this is where it gets fun for me as an artist because now we've shown the overall shape of the animal, but we've got to deliver some more information about the way in which light curves around it or, or light shades, uh, the, the, body, the animal's body shades itself from light in certain ways and the way light hits it. So now we get form and depth being um, conveyed by the relative brightness, the tone of the animal points, as well as the changes in the, the actual coloration patterns of the animal. I'm so curious how, you, how you're going to do shading <laughs> with that medium. Yeah. I've, I've seen you do that with so many different things now. I'm, I'm, I'm curious how you're going to pull this yeah. off. And I'm still a little bit wondering if I should try the, the pointillism, but I think that's going to take a little bit too long. So uh, what we're going to do instead is use, we're going to switch to our thinner pen, because this was the O2. I'm going to switch to the 005, which is like a really, really thin one. It's got like a tiny, tiny tip. You can't really see it. Uh, we can show... Is there another camera that's better? Um, camera oh, three be? should be this one, if the one above This one here? Okay. So I, if I can zoom in a little bit closer, it probably won't focus right. Yeah, it's probably too... That's okay. It's so small, <laughs> you can't see it. <laughs> it's barely within you, our setup you, dimension. You, you promise. It's yeah. really, really, really thin. It's saying. very thin, exactly. Yeah. Um, and it should be able to make a 0.2 millimeter line thickness. Okay. So the reason that's important is because it allows us to... Um, to make lines that don't look like outline components, but but just very, very fine, thin. So, you know, you can get different thicknesses of these pens and it's useful for that. So that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, and I'm gonna start in various places where we might see a little bit of extra shade. For example, uh, on the, the place along the mouth, is if my mouth is closed, I'm gonna try to talk through it, you can still see there's this bit of a, you know, kind of a, <laughs> a little bit of a, a, a notch. And so you can see this shading happening from my top lip. Uh, and then there's a little bit of more light coming on the bottom lip. So that's kind of what we're going to be doing here. A little bit of uh, <laughs> animation happening at the same time. So I'm an artist and I'm a performer at the same time. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, while we're a little bit distracted, I'm going to throw in a question. Uh, do you ever work in graphite and uh, charcoal? Yeah, I yeah, love that too. Absolutely. Graphite pencils and charcoal, absolutely. It's a beautiful. Um, actually, pencils were pretty much my first medium as I was starting artwork. And um, I love working with, with pencil, with graphite, either like regular pencils or like graphite sticks or whatever. Uh, you can do some spectacular things with that. And if you get the right kind of paper with the right kind of tooth, a little bit of texture to it, um, you can get some really, really nice uh, things happening that way. Uh, I like to use more toothy paper with, with graphite, unless I want really, really high detail, in which case uh, I need to use smoother papers. But, uh, and then charcoal is also a beautiful medium to work with. The kinds of gradients, the smooth shades you can get with charcoal are just beautiful. Uh, there is a paleo artist friend of mine who has always been kind of a hero and one that I looked at his work for ages as I was growing up. So he was one of the few that were at the time very active, um, Douglas Henderson. And he did a lot of work with charcoal and just gorgeous landscapes. He's, he was, he's initially a landscape artist uh, who also then uh, developed uh, paleo art as his main line of work. And uh, so he's got this beautiful background in backgrounds, uh, you know, not just the animals, but their the, the, the geology, the overall landforms, and the plants, the plant community. So he puts a lot of time into making sure that they look appealing as scenes instead of just having like an animal and then like a parking lot behind it sort of thing. Uh, and so I've been very inspired by his efforts to try to put as much effort as much as I can also into backgrounds, which is very much not what we're doing right now, by the way. Happy, <laughs> but, happy little trees. Yeah, happy little trees and clouds and just all the right kinds. And absolutely, I love doing that. 
But uh, right now we're focusing on a marine environment and there's not a lot to see behind this uh, porpoise because it's in midwater. So kind of uh, just kind of cancels out everything I said. But graphite and especially um, especially um, uh, uh, charcoal is really great for generating uh, these beautiful kinds of backgrounds with uh, shading and so you can get. Okay, and I believe uh, it's it's already, it's already time. time. It's okay. already time for a break. All right, all right. Well, We've been <laughs> good. So, uh, Julius and I are going to take a break of about 10 minutes time. Uh, we're going to let you watch uh, what's going on on this camera here so you can see a behind the scenes view. This is Julius actual face when we're yeah, not this, this is me. when we're the, not adding the CGI. What you this saw is... before was photoshopped <laughs> AI sort of thing. This is actually what I look like and inside I'm actually a computer and you know, it, it's a weird living this way, but you know, this is easier for people to interpret, so we do this. Yeah, we, that's that's one of the things that we do to make this more palatable for the for the general public. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to go on this quick little break, and we'll be back in about uh, ten minutes or so. Time is it? Ten minutes, Christine? I'm just going to stare at my screen here. Yes, it's ten minutes. So we're going to be back in ten minutes. See you guys all then.
All right. Uh, let me press, I guess, this button here. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> this is Canvas and Currents, episode number three. I'm here with my friend Julius Chetany, who's an award-winning artist. Um, he's a paleo artist. He's also a scientist. He's a, he holds a PhD in microbiology, actually. And that makes him the only scientist in the room. Uh, <laughs> Um, but we try our best to both of us to inform you, um, engage you in discussions uh, about conservation, teach you a little bit about the species that we talk about today. That is the harbor porpoise. And Julius is actually drawing one right now. Or indeed, I am. Yeah. I am indeed. Yes, so this is uh, the harbor porpoise that we've set up and outlined uh, in the first half of the show. So now we've got a general posture, its pose. And from here on, we're going to do uh, a couple of things. We're going to start giving it some depth uh, using shading, you know, interpreting how light falls on it and how its body shades uh, itself uh, on the lower parts. And also, we're going to add some color patterning. Uh, and that I'm probably going to do largely with uh, the, the markers that I've got here. So actually, what we're going to do probably is begin with some of the markers uh, to give it a little bit of color. And um, this should be kind of a, a fun bit because these animals do have a really interesting sort of color pattern. And um, just get the right marker here and the right tip kind of thing happening. Um, we're going to use the brush tip, I think, for this guy. And I've actually selected several different um, types of colors of markers here. And this should give us a bit of a range of, of darkness to the body. And... Uh, Darkness, very important. Yes, here we go. Because these guys have, so a lot of animals, whether they're living above water or underwater, employ a particular um, strategy using coloration called counter shading. And so the point of it is that animals want to hide from their predators or from their prey so they can sneak up on prey without being detected or, you know, prevent being uh, predated upon by predators. And so when you're underwater, um, the, all the light is coming from above typically, right? And we've talked about the, the, the maximum amount that light can kind of spread out sideways coming through the, the interface between air and water. It's about 55 degrees. So light is always coming mostly from above. So that means that an animal who is swimming in the water that has this, a solid color will have a up, brighter upper surface where the light hits it. And then the sides, the light hits only sort of a little bit at an angle, so it's a little dark, a little less bright. And then underneath, the animal shades itself, and so it's a darker area. And so you've got this, this you know, solid colored water column, and then you've got this bright, medium, dark object, which really stands out. So the way to hide underwater is to employ counter shading, which means that you, your bottom part of your body that would normally be darker you have a lighter color there and a darker color on your back. So it effectively cancels out the highlights and shadows that are normally caused by sunlight uh, hitting the animal from above and then shading underneath. And so when you employ counter shading, the animal effectively sort of vanishes into the background and it looks like just background water. So harbor porpoises employ counter shading. They do have a darker back. They do have a lighter belly. And then they have some models on the sides. Maybe we should uh, we should show them that yeah, uh, illustration picture. again because we can that. see that. Yeah. Let me just uh, load that up then. I think the best example would mm -hmm. probably be the uh, spectacle porpoise there. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. Yeah, the spectacle porpoise is great. Although um, it's good, but um, the sharp line, I'll show it in a second, uh, is maybe less effective in some ways. It depends on, on the environment. Uh, share screen. I guess they use the giant dorsal fin as a distraction. <laughs> It's like, what is that? <laughs> there we go. He's sharing it now. Okay, I'm bringing that up on screen again. Okay, so there you go. So once again, the harbor porpoise here on the upper right has a lighter colored belly and throat and a darker colored back. And then there's this mottling that takes place sort of in between. There's a bit of a gradient. So that's, you can see how if it was lit up from above and then having a shadow underneath, that would effectively kind of cancel out some of that, that appearance of the animal. And most of them actually employ a similar strategy to varying degrees. 
the Indo-Pacific finless porpoise on the lower left, for example, Dallas porpoise to a lesser extent in that it doesn't go along the body all the way, that lighter part. The vaquita is, does a pretty good job of it as well. The spectacled porpoise does a really good job of, of light on the bottom and dark on top with an interesting, really sharp line in between. That's kind of interesting. Uh, and then there are others like the narrow ridged finless porpoise, which is in pretty much monotone. And so this one, I believe lives in, um, I believe it lives in more turbid water, so it actually might not be as visible as other ones anyway from a distance. So it, it kind of gets away by hiding behind the turbidity of the water, if I'm not mistaken, in some cases. Yeah, I have such a hard time keeping the two finless poppies apart. Yeah. Uh, one of them has the, the subspecies, the Yangtze uh, that, finless That would be this poppies. one. That would be that's the one. one. And yeah, yeah they, they so. live in, in, in the Yangtze River, so which that's very, very... very yeah, well, I mean, you can't see anything underwater. There like, you go. So you know, they're kind of hidden anyway because the, the, the turbidity in the water, the particles kind of hide it from view. So you don't have to invest uh, energy into generating a particular color pattern on the body. Um, so yeah, uh, the harbor porpoise definitely uses counter shading. And so we're just going to go and get back to drawing it. <laughs> so I'm going to use some of these markers. Um, First time I've tried these particular ones, and we'll see how that goes. And so, <laughs> yeah, we, this is all by the, the, the seat of our pants, right? So actually, what I'm going to do before that is I'm going to erase out some of the lines that I had for the outline, because once I get this ink in, it's going to be a little bit harder to get those erased, and some of it I want to clean up a little bit. It's just the pencil that I had as a guidelines underneath it. Just make the whole thing look a little cleaner. Yeah, there we go. Lots of shavings. You know what? When I'm doing uh, digital illustration, I sometimes catch myself trying to rub off the shavings after I, <laughs> after I use the, 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 the shavings of the screen. Yeah. <laughs> God. <laughs> anyway, yeah, there's interesting little bits that, uh, things that we do when we. I think it's less stuff. embarrassing than trying to like hit the undo button on your sheet of oh, paper I've constantly. Oh, I've tried that. Or yeah. I, I've, I've, I've stopped a, I've taken breaks from doing traditional pieces and I look to. I go to press control S to save and like realize, wait, that doesn't actually work here. Yep. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna put some of these um, color patterns on can, the can animal. Can you imagine if you're doing like an acrylic painting and yep. you'll be able to save multiple versions right? of it? Yeah, absolutely. That would be, be nice. fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can photograph it. And you have a digital version sort of thing. I've done right. that before. Right. Right. So you get very various stages, but um, it's all digital anyway. So we're gonna put some some color onto the animal. Um, this is really nice, actually, these, these markers, they're sort of in between colors. And so I'm just gonna try a couple of different ones here to get a bit of, you see, I'm, I'm starting with the dorsal fin here because this is where it, the, the light is hitting it not so much, it's, it's sideways, right? So um, you don't have a, a lot of brightness. So this is actually kind of mostly shaded. Okay. And then, and then, as I mentioned, so <laughs> the thing is, we can't kind of do the color patterns and the shading separately, right? We're not doing this digitally. I can't put it into different layers. So I have to think in terms of what the final thing will look like overall. So it's a matter of trying to figure out how the color patterns and the illumination balance to generate the tones that we see as a whole. So it's a little bit more challenging, but it means that we're going to have an organism that looks less like it has a really sharp, you know, delineated patterns because we're also incorporating the, the shading. So let's keep that in mind. So I'm doing this all in one shot, basically. So also along those lines, I'm going to go to the, the mouth area, and we were just talking about this before, where the upper jaw where it meets the lower jaw along that mouth line there's a little bit of that shadow that takes place as there's a little bit of that divot in between mm -hmm. like that it's almost like working with a paintbrush here but it's like i never have to actually pick up paint um and then as i mentioned the um the eye the bone structure around the eye uh is such that there's a little bit of a bulge around the eye and so you can see that as it, it sort of self shades on the lower side of it. This is a little bit of a, a bump here. And also underneath the chin now, 
we start to get some shading visible. Remember, the chin of the animal is white in color, so we can't just use the same reasoning as on the upper jaw, for example. So it's actually going to be lighter here, even though it's more shaded. Okay? So counter shading is doing its job. It's exactly what we expect to happen. I'll also add, this is a little bit of a lighter color than the one we used last for the upper jaw. So I'm going to kind of blend it a little bit there to make it a little bit softer. So we're ending up with a, sort of these nice smooth gradients on the animal using these very light toned markers. Uh, and you know, this is one of the types of, of medium that I've not really used much at all in, in the past, just very little bit, these markers. And so this is kind of a new experience for me. So, you know, these shows are fun because we get to all explore what we're doing, including <laughs> the people who are putting on the show. <laughs> so. We were saying just a few minutes ago during the break, like, I'm just as surprised every time we do this program as, as, as you are out there watching this program live. Um, and, and the same is true for Julius. He woke up this morning, had no idea what he would be doing. So it's, it's we're experimenting quite a bit here. And yeah. I'm, I'm so fascinated by the fact that you have a light gray marker. <laughs> I've yeah, never I, seen well, one. See, I, these are great. I had no idea this even existed. I mean, if you want, like, the, I know that there's a lot of people that use Copic markers. Those are really the more expensive ones. I haven't tried those myself, but these are a little bit of a you know similar kind of a product, but a little bit easier to um, afford. So for this kind of a thing, it works. If I was going to go really heavy duty into professional um, work with markers, I would probably invest in something even a little bit more sophisticated. But uh, for now, this works really well. And there's the nice range of, of colors and tones that's available. I only selected a very few of them when I picked up materials for this show. Uh, there's quite a nice diversity. So that's really great. And the other nice thing about these markers is that they they get a little darker as you apply more. So there's this there's this nice bit of, um, of fade happening um, that's dependent on how long you... Uh, apply it. And so it gives you more control over how dark you want a particular region to be. Just have to repeat some of the strokes. So it's, you know, you work stepwise. This happens with all kinds of artwork. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that everybody works stepwise. There are some absolutely magnificently skilled artists that are able to pull off a uh, much more rapid application of paint uh, in like single shots. And I'm always amazed at those. But um, usually I'm not at that level. I need to work harder to get there. That blends so well, though. Yeah. I'm really impressed. Yeah. In fact, I, I also have a blending tool. Which one is the blending tool here? It's probably this one here. Uh, white. No, it's, that's a white. Oh, that's a white. Hey, that'll be useful, too. <laughs> Things I packed, I'd forgotten I packed. <laughs> um, actually, one of these is a... One of these is the blender, isn't it? There we go. Oh, that's the blender. Yeah, that's why. <clears throat> yeah, makes sense. Okay, good. So here we go. So with this, with this one that I've just added here, this is the the darker part of the the flipper on the underside, and that is quite dark because that's sort of the most shaded that it gets, and also on the underside of the animal. But especially here because it's also it's not getting hit by light, but it's also getting shade from other objects around it, like the animal's body. It's 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 getting less light hitting it than, than an oak exposed part of the underside of the animal where there's nothing to even you know, prevent reflected light from below or, ref or, or scattered light from below hitting it. So that's why these corners, these like the armpits of the animal, for example, are gonna be the darkest because it's accessing the least light, direct or indirect from the water column around it. Mm -hmm. And then a similar thing happens on the underside of this flipper. Gets a dark edge on the underside but it's narrow. Remember, we're looking at this a little bit edge on partly. So we're only seeing a little, little bit of the where it starts to get darker toward the side. But the, the flippers of this animal are actually dark in color. So that's the other reason why it's so dark on this one. And I'm actually going to ramp up a little bit of the darkness even further to take that into account. Uh, just make sure I have the right one of these. And which is the darkest one. Yeah, it's probably this one. Add some more depth to it, like that. And it kind of blends together a little bit as it dries and, and soaks into it. This paper is mostly bleed free, but there's still a little bit of bleeding that happens. Uh, but it works out quite well overall. And again, a little bit underneath the, uh, the jaw, upper jaw of the animal. 
And now I'm going to go back and add some to the underside of the chin. And then we can blend it afterwards a little bit more. And it doesn't have to be perfect either. You know, you can, it doesn't have to be fully smooth. Um, you can get away with a few kind of little things that are out of the lines or whatever. It adds character to the painting in many ways, right? So, uh, and then there are also natural variations in brightness along the sides of the animal's mouth and things like that. And the surface isn't absolutely smooth. Like they, yeah. they as they live their lives, if you have an adult, right. adult animal, they, they will have uh, like little scratches and scars. There you go. And there you go. They're not as go. pristine as we would like to imagine mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not like grown in a lab or something <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> yeah, we don't want them to be grown in a lab, right? Um, so here we go. We've got this animal has got... Now the upper part here is going to be a little bit darker. And to do that, not only am I going to add a little bit of darkness here, but when we go back over with the, with the very fine um, black marker, we can add a little bit more hatching to it. So it's going to be a little bit of a mixed... Um, approach. Uh, it's not mixed media, but it is a sort of a mix of techniques we're using to do this. Remember that the upper part of the animals, like the head area, is much darker, and so we can kind of add a bit more darkness here than on the undersurface of the jaw. And then, of course, also there's this um, this line, this pattern that happens, similar to what the Vikita has a little bit. There's this bit of a dark line that comes down from the back of the jaw, and connects to the pectoral fins of the flippers. So that's actually part of the color markings of the animal. And then around the eye, there's a little bit of a lighter area. So again, all of this, I'm trying to think in, in a sort of a, a synthesized uh, way between the color patterns and where how much light falls on various parts of the animals. It's, it's a very challenging way to be trying to think. Uh, and so you can get some interesting effects and you kind of have to go back and forth a few times to darken areas that you've left a bit lighter because you didn't want to overdo it. Um, so it, it's, it's a very combined approach. And this marker I'm using right now is a blender actually. So it actually has mostly just the solvent and it helps to kind of smooth edges. So you see that's kind of what's happening here. And it pretty much vanishes after it dries, but it helps to make us these smoother transitions kind of thing. And then here we go, and then there's this other one here. This is a nice color. It's a cool gray as well. Let's see if this one works to darken some areas a little bit. That's nice too. You know, if I had a full set of these markers, we could go, you know, do some really neat things, but we don't need all of them for this particular purpose here. Okay, there's the eye, I've darkened the eye. Again, I'm going to darken some areas around the eye. And yeah, again, there's a little bit of, little bit of stochasticity in where you put some of the, the color. And also because, yeah, these porpoises have a lot of speckling on their body. So that's inherently going to cause some changes in, you know, what different parts look like uh, in terms of the, the smoothness. And I'm always keeping in mind that the blender is nearby so that I can smooth out some of these edges if I want to make them a little bit smoother. All that helps. It's kind of a back and forth approach. And then again, darken some of these areas where like that line that comes down from the back of the jaw toward the flippers. That's kind of a dark line. And then again, at the upper edge, uh, sort of the lower edge of the upper jaw, there is actually sort of a darker patchiness kind of happening there like that. And even a little bit at the uh, the very front end of some of the lower jaw, the very tip, there's a little bit of patchiness that happens. It's almost like they have little, well, maybe some of it is a little bit of scarring due to impact with objects sometimes. Because, um, you know, to manipulate things, or with the fish they hunt, or whatever, you know. And it's not always smooth, and they can impact. They have a very high success rate of catching fish. Something like, what is it, like 90% of the fish that they they target, they, they catch really efficient hunters. Uh, which is great, because they don't waste a lot of energy hunting. And of course, if you don't waste energy, you can retain that for other things that you can use for. So uh, efficiency is the key to survival in, um, well, in everything, in other animals as well as in us, right? We want to be as efficient as we can so that we can spend more time doing fun things like going on trips to fun warm islands or whatever. <laughs> or just spending time in the water observing animals and all sorts of fun things. Um, so I'm going to start putting in some of the darker areas on the side of the animal's body here. 
there's going to be some speckling happening, so you're going to see a little bit of unusual color patterns like that. I'm going to go with in between colors, I'm back and forth between different um, different colors um, and different tones, and that's going to give that little bit of weird stochasticity that we kind of need for a harbor porpoise, which has a lot of speckling. And then up on here, I'm going to go a little bit darker right to the top because this is a very dark area of the animal, and so we can always add a little bit more dark on the sides to accentuate those shadows. We don't have to have the very upper part of the animal completely white, right? Because um, it's still going to look a little bit dark. It wants to sort of match the background. Um, and uh, the background is not totally bright, so we're going to have a bit of a gray on the top anyway. So yeah, so it turns out we're doing very much most of this shading using these markers. So very much, like I said, it's a lot like using paints, like watercolor, for example, or wash or something like that. Um, and uh, I don't want to confuse you. I'm just, mm -hmm. uh, no worries. <laughs> I'm just trying to flip this camera image, mm -hmm. and I think it doesn't actually support this. No, I don't understand why. <laughs> if there's any OBS experts out there who know how to how to mirror this uh, image so we see the right side up then uh, oh, yeah that would be a way to do it let me know i wish i knew how to do this <laughs> uh, i can because yeah i mean flipping the screen is not so practical physically inverting it no come on this has to be possible and so somebody asked earlier about using graphite or charcoal. In those situations, you really have to think very much in an integrated way as to how an animal's, you know, the tones on its body will look uh, when combining the color pattern and the illumination conditions. And so you kind of get a feel for that over time. And um, here, really, I'm just doing that by keeping in mind that the back of the animal is the darkest part. And there's a sort of a, a sharper delineation toward the, the middle part here. And then as we go up toward the back of the animal, that sort of lightens, uh, even though it is inherently a darker tone in terms of the pigments of the animal. But because the sunlight is hitting it from above, naturally that part's going to actually look a little bit brighter. It's going to be a bit of a gradient. And to um, enhance that gradient a little bit, we're again going to go back using my blender brush here to smooth out some of those lines that show up. That gives it a little bit better look that way. So I was able to I was able to flip it actually. Oh, excellent. It, look at that. It, that looks even weirder. So now I look <laughs> like I'm right-handed. <laughs> Which doesn't matter because this is actually a symmetrical animal. That doesn't mean, however, that all cetaceans are. The really cool thing is that if you look at uh, fin whales, for example, uh, they are asymmetrical in their color patterning. The right and the left uh, half sides of the animal are colored differently. Uh, there's a the darkness, the dark pe pigments um, on. Oh, I forget what what which side is darker, which side is lighter. But they're 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 set up so that one half of the animal actually has a darker undersurface to its um, uh, to its head than the other side. So they're actually consistently asymmetrical in a very particular way. So that's actually really kind of a neat thing you have, and I don't know what's selected for that. Why are they consistently asymmetrical in their coloration in one way? That's pretty rare among animals. Um, in harbor porpoises, we don't have that. We just have, you know, one side of the animal looks very much like the other side. Not a perfect mirror, but, but you know, enough that it's, there's no substantial difference in the markings. So we're okay with a flipped image because it still looks like a harbor porpoise. But it would not be okay if I was doing a fin whale. Or, uh, or a crab that had a very particular handedness in which of its claws was larger because we see that happening too, right? So it's another example. So okay. I, ma I managed to flip that again, not just horizontally, mm -hmm. but also vertically. Excellent. Vertically, and then so now it's correct. Then we get yeah. that. Yes. Right on. <laughs> right on. Very nice. So now we're now we can draw fin wheels if we want as well, <laughs> safely. <laughs> but we're not doing that today. Um, here we go. So as I start to add some of this speckling wow. here, we're starting to get more complicated patterns and such. Um, and also the shadow from underneath the animal's body. 
we're merging both processes now and trying to find something in between. And the faster I move the marker over the surface, the, the less pigment is delivered. So that's another way for me to lighten some of that. So here I kind of went really quickly over some of those bits to leave only a little bit of, of ink, which then allows me to create a gradient that way too. So that's another fun little technique that you can use when using markers. Um, speed can make a difference in how much ink is left behind. So here we go, add the underside shading. And then as I get higher again, I'm just going to speed it up so that we're only getting a little bit. The other thing is you can use the, the animal's body shape to, you know, or lines to sort of follow the animal's um, cross-sectional shape kind of thing to give it that depth and the curvature, the, the perceived curvature of the body toward the bottom. So those kind of curved lines, and that's what we do with, um, with hatching with a dark, darker pen, like a black pen. If we were going to draw those lines, we would do them in such a way that they kind of follow the contours of the animal's body so that it gives us that extra depth in appearance. So various techniques you can use to add depth to your drawing. Um, whether you're using sort of smooth gradients of paints or sharp lines to generate hatching and, or, or stippling pointillism or whatever. Well, pointillism, you wouldn't actually really use that as much. You would, because it is so, so smooth, the, the, the gradients you can generate, you don't actually have to end up using lines that delineate um, the curvature of the animal. But you can also line up some of the, the dots that you lay down um, on the paper so that they do effectively create sort of these curved, curvilinear lines. Um, but anyway, here we go toward the back here. Now back here, there's going to be a little bit more of a sharp contrast between the dark and the light of the animal. So I'm going to keep that in mind for the future. And there's going to be one more darker level of paint that I'm going to add to it. But around here, there's a lot of speckling happening. So it's the most speckled of the porpoises. <laughs> Right. So that's going to be fun. And this, as Marcus was saying, it's like it's almost like a fingerprint. They're very different between individuals and the patterns. And I've uh, volunteered a lot at the Marine Mammal Rescue Center as well here in Vancouver. And we um, treat a lot of, of baby seal pups who are orphaned or abandoned or injured. And so we see enormous variation in their the patterning of, 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 their, uh, of their pelage, of their fur from some that are mostly white with some little gray speckles to ones that are almost all black with a few white bits and everything in between. And they are absolutely wonderful to see that kind of the variation, the beautiful little animals. And, uh, you know, and then we release them at the end of the season. And then they have a nice head start to their life. They can, they've learned how to eat fish. And now they're all ready to go and become adult seals. And it's always a, a beautiful experience to attend a release um, uh, because you see them finally get free and start their lives and you know it's a little bit bittersweet because you you grow to like them a lot um, but you know it's nice to see them start to enter the world that, in which they are natural uh, inhabitants i'm going to add a, some uh, shadows here to the flukes and the tail kind of fin which notice is very much opposite in the orientation of that of fish right uh, fish typically uh, use side-to-side -side sinusoidal motion of their body uh, to propel them forward with this uh, very vertically oriented uh, tail fin. It's the opposite with uh, marine mammals like whales. They have muscles that move their body up and down near the tail stalk and then use the, the, the paddle of their flukes to um, move them forward um, by transferring that up and down motion into... Uh, thrust through the water, and um, so it's a, it's very much the sort of a, at a right angles to the way in which most fish use their uh, their bodies to move themselves through the water. And I've just pulled up a a few oh, of the <laughs> current patients at the rescue center. Yeah, um, these are the aww moments. I mean, look at that face; <laughs> they're beautiful. We try not to you know lock eyes with them. We try to not make eye contact with them because we don't want them to be become used to humans. The point of raising them or to helping them out at the center is not to, to make pets of them. We want to keep this, this healthy distance between animals and humans so that we can, when they're released, they won't be attracted to, you know, approach other humans, but have a nice wild life, you know, because they're wildlife. 
And so we do that. But, you know, you look at them and, and you know, as you pass by and check on them and, you know, in the corner of your eyes, they're just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, and I, I think people can see uh, on the other variation, like this animal, almost completely dark, but go. not quite. There's still a little bit of, of pigmentation there. Uh, and then I guess all the way to uh, almost completely white, like... Uh, like this guy here. Yeah, right. There's it's lots like of little very, black speckles like on this very, very light colored coat. Yeah. And then the beautiful little facial patterns as well around the eyes and the nose. Yeah. Yeah. One of these days we're going to do, we're going to do seals. As yeah, well. <laughs> that'll be popular. And sea otters. We did a sea otters um, how to draw session actually a while back. Yes, we did. It's, it's a little bit of a simpler one, um, but we haven't done seals yet. Or, or any of this kind of uh, artwork with seals. Um, I mean, I have painted a seal for uh, one of the sort of uh, promotional bits, but um, not on air like this. So this should be kind of fun to do that for one of the programs. So now we're getting, you know, pretty developed in, in getting some of this, this darkness on the animal. Now I'm going to add some of these darker areas. Like remember where I mentioned here where it it goes from really dark on top to really light underneath. There's a bit more of a sharper contrast there. And that's what's happening here. And then toward the front, there's this sort of in kind of a not very smooth, but sort of broken uh, and wavy line toward the front as the uh, as this dark area is um, gives way to the light area underneath. Again, the counter shading is happening. And the way in which it transitions from one to the other varies a lot from place to place on the animal. Here it's kind of, it gets a lot more interrupted and then interrupted by speckles and such as well. So we're going to see a little bit of both happening. Some smooth edges and some speckles. And toward the back here, that's where you get a little bit smoother line delineating that dark to light transition. And then as we go here, we'll start to add a few of these. Now, what I'm doing here, this is this is hatching, right? So I'm, I'm actually controlling the darkness by varying the distance between the lines. Okay, so it's narrow lines, but some have very little distance between them. So that makes them look to the eye darker in those areas. And then very much wider distance toward the top of the animal. So we're combining an approach here of using different toned markers with an approach using um, hatching these, these lines that we draw to generate an overall tone that we're looking to, to be able to see. And in addition to that, because we have that blender, I can use the blender to kind of smooth out some of this. So hopefully what we're going to end up with is something a little bit more like a gradient is what, what I'm after here. Okay, so there we go. That's kind of getting what I'm closer to what I'm after. So you have blenders in, in these markers. These are alcohol-based markers, but you also have blenders in colored pencils. So uh, you can have a similar kind of an effect happen with different kind of media. And of course, you don't need blenders with certain types of things like oil paints or whatever because they, they spread so beautifully or some oil pastels as well. Um, you can actually blend them by hand afterwards and then it's fine. But with these kinds of markers that are kind of like a plus minus in terms of the presence or absence of the pigment, you do kind of benefit from using blenders some of the time. Okay, so I'm adding a little bit more darkness. As I mentioned, we have to kind of go back and forth and darken some things afterwards that weren't as dark as we wanted first time. And that's normal. You know, artwork, creating a piece like this is a very multi-step progress process. And uh, sometimes you do really need to kind of go over it more than once. Yeah, so. And then I'll go over this with the blender as well to remove some of these lines and, and such. Uh, just to kind of make it a little bit smoother. There we go. And then that gives it a little bit more of a natural look. Not perfect, but it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, the nice thing about doing artwork like this is that you're, you're putting your own sort of signature style into it. And it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, like it was generated by some sort of a computer program. It, it's nice to see a little bit of that, um, that painterly uh, effects 
uh, and it's, it, it gives your artwork that individual quality um, that only you can add to it. So yeah, so Harbor Porpoises, um, they exist in relatively large numbers here, but some areas like in the Black Sea, where they have that disjointed population, there are less than 12,000 left. And in different places in the world, they experience different kinds of threats. The biggest threat that harbor porpoises experience is from entanglement in nets set for other species of, say, fish, for example. And so they get entangled, and because they are air-breathing mammals, right, they don't have gills, they, when they're entangled underwater, because a lot of the time they hunt not at the surface but below, suddenly they can't get to the surface to breathe and they drown. And so that's what ends up happening to a lot of them. Uh, and that's the unfortunate thing. There are thousands of them lost this way every year. Yeah, there's a total of about 300,000 or so, I think there was a statistic, whales, porpoises, and dolphins that get entangled in fishing nets every year. It's pretty awful. Uh, and it's so unnecessary. Um, there are ways to counter this. So, um, for example, some... Well, nets and, and other kind of lines, for example, cause this. So one example is um, the North Atlantic right whales are the most endangered of the baleen whales, and there are probably less than 300 of them left. And um, one of the problems is that, they, that they face is becoming entangled in uh, the long lines um, for lobster traps uh, that are set. And so the alternative to that is to use these uh, lobster traps at the bottom that aren't connected to those long lines, but that are remotely released um, from the bottom when once they, you know, have snagged lobsters. And so, to do that, um, you manage to eliminate the major source of entanglement for the species, which could mean the difference between life and death, not of individuals only, but of an entire species. So that's a big thing. That's a very significant development. Um, if we can get um, you know, governments to help fund fishermen to or fishers to um, use these these new technologies because you know it needs to be economically viable. Then we are w very much winning when it comes to removing some major threats from certain highly endangered species. We need to kind of work together this way. We don't want to, you know, lay all of the blame and all of the responsibility on those people who are hardworking. Um, to, you know, make a living to catch fish. We need to help them out as much as possible. And that's where it's nice to have a, a government that has funds set aside for this. And that's where some of our taxes are going to go. So it's, you know, governments in, in which we all contribute somewhat um, to the, the overall funds that are available. This is where it's really our responsibility and duty as much as we can to become involved in the formulation of policy, because then we have some say as much as we can over how our taxes will be used. And so I and a whole bunch of us have been involved in advocating to various levels of government to generate policies that maximally help wildlife in various ways. And some of that includes um, funding uh, initiatives that help to offset some of the costs uh, that fishers would have to um, shoulder to be able to use technologies that, that less endanger some wildlife. I just wanted to add that you mentioned uh, that we're looking at uh, conserving an entire species potentially, but when we're talking about harbor purpose, there's a lot of uh, populations. We mm -hmm. said there's about 700,000 to a million of these individuals, which sounds sort of like a big number. And you think like, okay, they must be doing fine then. But there's individual populations mm -hmm. that are very unique in like the adaptations and the, the kinds of food that they eat and possibly culture. We just don't yes. know, you know, so little about them that are doing, doing well, not fine um, in the Baltic Sea and uh, in the Black Sea yep. uh, for harbor purpose where, where numbers have dwindled to the point where those populations, those individual populations are um, critically endangered as well. And when they've been separated from other populations uh, physically for so long, 
in some cases, that's, that's when you have the generation of new species over time. So it's very important to consider how genetically distinct some of these populations are from each other, because in some cases, we could actually be losing a whole new species, a whole different species, if, if a particular population goes extinct, that we haven't had a chance to study well enough to, to determine that, in fact, it was a distinguished species uh, from, from the sort of the mother species or thing, uh, the, the, the species from which they diverged when they became physically separated and isolated from them. These are things that are important. Again, we need funding for scientists, for ecologists, marine biologists to go and be able to study these populations and determine how much genetic diversity there is in them, which ones in fact constitute distinct species and um, when there's a distinct species, it, it does make it a little bit easier to obtain funding for conservation for individual species than for in, you know, separate populations of the species. So, you know, if there is an, uh, a separate species that, that has been missed, sort of a hidden species, it, it, there, there's a benefit for putting effort into recognizing that so that it can receive um, better protection. Right, and sometimes just getting... Uh, getting governments or getting any any kind of organization or uh, funders to to give money uh, for a species that people maybe haven't even heard about uh, is raising awareness for them. Though, so that's part of why this program exists as well, because exactly. we just want to make sure that you learn about harbor purpose, uh, the species that uh, Julius is uh, drawing here right now. Yeah, so you know that's it. It's, it, it's good if we're able to enhance our knowledge about these. That's the first step. We need to learn about them before we can effectively protect them because in learning about them, we learn what are the worst threats that they face, you know, based on, on how they live. Um, and then, then we can draw, you know, parallels between how our activities, uh, you know, overlap with theirs and, um, and, and better moderate our activities so that we don't cause undue harm to them. And in the case of hapropropis, as we mentioned, fishing nets, we know kind of what the threat is and there's an easy way how you can make a difference. So if you wanna if you wanna contribute to that course, if you wanna have these these beautiful animals uh, protected and uh, prevent that unnecessary entanglement, because really it's it's very preventable. Um, you can have a look at uh, sustainable seafood mm -hmm. programs. We kind of mentioned that in almost every program because it's, yep. it's such a such a prevalent uh, threat. When we talk about cetaceans, they're all affected, no matter what the size is. Whether you're looking at uh, some of the largest animals like blue whales, which might be able to tear themselves away from one of those nets. But if you're looking at uh, the tiny harbor porpoise, they don't have a lot of time. If they become entangled, they, they drown. Um, it's and almost also, inev inevitable. Well, that's the other thing is that consider that if they tear themselves away from a net and tear some of the net with it, now if they're dragging along some of that net, that makes it harder for them to swim. They're wasting energy, and so they won't be able to swim as far to get the food necessarily that they, they, they might need, and they might starve just because they're using so much energy for something that shouldn't require that much energy. So even if they're able to tear, tear away, that doesn't necessarily mean they will survive in the long run. So a lot of complicating factors here. And that's where sustainable seafood programs come in. Uh, they kind of do the job for you to make a decision to decide uh, whether that particular piece of seafood that you're eating right now, whether it's consuming something at a restaurant or something that you buy at the supermarket, whether that's been caught uh, using more sustainable methods. And none of these programs are perfect. Um, like um, if you're here in Canada, you may have heard of Ocean Vise, um, if or Sea Choice. If you're in the United States, um, trying to remember the program. Uh, it's the um, the Monterey Bay's one. Um, yeah, it's it's a big one. The um, oh my goodness, <laughs> just Google this. Monterey Bay Aquarium <laughs> yeah, uh, the, uh, seafood program. Then you're gonna yeah, find that one as well. So there's one in the United this. States as well. Mm -hmm. And if you're anywhere else in the world, including uh, and in particular the UK, I think that's where that one was launched. Is the Marine Stewardship mm -hmm. Council or MSC? That's one of the global uh, programs as well. So you're gonna find that pretty much everywhere. So if you buy a, a, lot, a bit of pea is seafood, <laughs> then uh, you uh, may recognize uh, those logos, and they just give you a little bit of uh, a better idea where uh, how that particular 
Seafood uh, Watch. Count. Seafood Watch. That's, that's the one. The that's, one. The that's the one you got. The it. other thing is that um, I tend to be pretty selective with most of the fish that I eat. So um, we're lucky on the West Coast here because there is a um, an organization um, uh, called Kutera that does land-based salmon farming. So you also avoid the contamination of, of wild uh, salmon populations with a lot of the... Um, the, the parasites and so on that are introduced in, in those open pen um, sea uh, fish farms that, that are such a problem. And so if you have it completely land-based, then you're, you're, you're preventing that. Plus, you're also not interfering with natural stocks. It's um, all particular species, and it's available here, actually, in, in, in a couple of stores in Vancouver, and it's an island-based one. I believe it's in, uh, First Nations-owned, uh, so yes, I support it, it for that reason. And uh, it's delicious. It just it tastes really is. It like is. the yeah. wild thing yep. from the ocean yep. without yep. without all the things that comes with uh, farmed yep. salmon, which sometimes exactly. just looks so unnatural that they need to like actually add dye and paint them yep. to make them look somewhat healthy, so you even want to eat that still. I find this to be the most guilt-free form of fish, in my opinion, that I've found so far. Um, so you can also find some examples of, of fish that are um, that are caught that are invasive species. So that by catching those, um, you're removing some of the problematic in, in a species that have invaded from elsewhere that actually shouldn't be in an area. So you're maybe helping eco ecologically that way as well. Um, what I'm doing right now here is adding a little bit of blue to some of the edges because this animal will kind of reflect. Yeah, so we're actually got very little time left as well, <laughs> but we're getting right close to the end of it. So this is perfect. Uh, one of the things that you can do, we've been sort of advocating for this for a while, is that these kinds of drawing sessions, we can, um, when you draw something like this, one thing you can do with it is to, you know, illustrate some of the letters that you send to your government uh, representatives, you know, when you're asking them to you know, advocating for particular policy decisions. It's just one more way for them to remember your message a little bit better. And, and you know, what what person wouldn't like to get, you know, nice pictures from children or from adults that are, you know, nicely done like this. So it's just one more way to kind of hopefully get them to remember, to stand out a bit. In my case, they would look like they've been painted by children. <laughs> that, uh, but the effort, right? The effort. It's right? the effort. That's yeah, it. yeah, exactly. yeah. So there we go. Um, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much the animal here. This is how they pretty much look. And, uh, you know, you can add more detail and so on. But you know what, this is, this is pretty much, I'll, I'll call this one pretty much finished as it is. And this looks a lot like a harbor porpoise would look. And it's, it's beautiful. Thank and I'm, I'm still so impressed I'm how you can get that. i sign it here now because, you know, as an artist, we like to sign our things. <laughs> Please do. With a little tiny micro pen that I didn't get to use otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Ta-da. So this is our harbor porpoise, Focina Focina. And yeah. um, the, the, the genus and species names, basically. And actually, one last thing I'll do is add a little bit of darkness to the eye with the dark pen, because it looks kind of, it looks almost zombie-like to have this light gray eye. <laughs> I'm a little bothered by that happening here. I'm just going to give it a little bit more darkness in there. And then a little bit of perfection. <laughs> there has yeah. to be room for that. Yeah, some details in important places. There we go. That's our harbor porpoise kind of swimming along. Um, twisting through the waters, it does so. Um, little cute little guys. And if you're lucky, you'll get to see them. If you're out, uh, you know, on a ferry, for example, or 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 boating, or some places like um, Marcus, you've done from I think Saturna Island. You've got some nice viewing spots from the shore where you can see them, right? Land-based whale watching. It's my favorite oh, way of go. seeing these animals because you definitely are not gonna be an annoyance in the water they can't hear you you can you can yell and scream as much as you want <laughs> <laughs> above the surface they're not going to hear you so um as we do as we harbor porpoise enthusiasts do when we see them um and yeah who knows if, if you're out there and if you just keep looking for that tiny little dorsal just have a look at that tiny dorsal mm -hmm. compared to the animals it's actually pretty it's very small if you compare that to a killer whale like it's right. almost not there <laughs> So the, the big old males with the really tall dorsal fins sometimes. Those are spectacular. I've seen some of those. Beautiful. And watch episode one if you want to see what that, what that looks like. <laughs> well, in that one we had a female and, and a cat, but we did talk about it and we did show some pictures of them, some representative pictures. So yeah, there's, uh, there's, uh, they're covered well in episode one for sure. All right. Well, with that last minute running, and uh, Julius is literally going to be running out of here <laughs> when we when we hit the stop button in a few moments. Um, 
thank you so much everybody for watching uh thanks for those of you who sent through some question i'm sorry if you if you if you didn't get through, uh, to your question we were a little bit in a, uh, in a time crunch today uh we're gonna do a better job in in the next episode to try and get to sure. more of your questions yeah. And um, we uh, didn't mention uh, before, but uh, we're very grateful to come to you from the uh, unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, First Nations. Um, so I'd like to uh, definitely um, acknowledge that as well. And no matter where you're watching from, there's a good chance that really, no matter where on this planet you are, uh, there is an, an indigenous people that was there uh, long before settlers arrived and has uh, that very close relationship to the land to the stay. Um, and a lot we can learn from them. So much we need to we need to absolutely because they lived there in a sustainable way for thousands of years before we got here. And now the last few hundred years, we've been messing everything up in terms of the populations of many of these animals. So yeah, we got it's, to learn. It's up. It's up to us to, to try and undo some of these things as we're trying to do with this program by try, uh, trying and educating people about cetaceans and pretty much all marine life. We said mm, one yeah, day absolutely. we're even going to be trees and talk about the, no, yeah. the relationship between the land deep and the sea. Yeah. Many, oh, yeah, deep ocean. Yeah, lots of um, things there. Mm. Okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> We've reached, I'm, I'm, we've reached the end for sure um, thank you everybody for watching uh, we're going to be back in December definitely with the December episode number 4 we have no idea what it's going to be um, Julius doesn't know I don't know if Let's, you have ideas send them in if you have like you know great ideas we'll look at them absolutely leave leave us some comments let us know how you like this program if there's anything you think we should be doing better we'd love to hear about it as well um, and with that um, we're going to leave you thanks again for watching and uh, have a good night everyone Bye -bye. thank you everyone